and there when your service is over, if you wish to take yours that you have put or toes put in your honor, you may pick them up and take them. Uh, they are looking pretty, and I hope that you will enjoy them as well as we think of today. So you can take them after, after worship or after you're going to leave from after lunch. We'll leave the sanctuary open. Bring people to hold up in prayers this morning. The two of them are already in our prayer list, but I want to bring them up to the top. And that was Scott Wright. He had surgery this week, but doing well, I think, better. So we're praying for that. And Tony Cobb is home and doing better, I pray. So let's end with that. But I got to I think y'all remember James Hartnett, right? Yes. Well, James has Stephen here. And uh, his sister, Margaret Dunaway, is uh, in the hospital with pancreatitis. That's James Hartnett's sister, all right, right? Is that right, Betty? That's right, Stephen? Yes, it is. Okay. I'm in my time, I'm not sure I was getting correct, but anyway, that's where it is. But let's call those in our prayers this day. And with that, be pleased that you're being put in the worship.
please stand for the entry of the light. Stand Sunday of Advent, requesting that God restore us, for this is what Advent is about, a Savior to restore us. That is what he did for Israel. Those who have been ransomed by the Lord will return. They will enter Jerusalem singing, crowned with everlasting joy. Sorrow and mourning will disappear, and they will be filled with joy and gladness. That's Isaiah 35, 10. We light this candle today as a symbol of, our, of Christ, our joy. May the joyful promise of your presence, O oh God, make us rejoice in our hope of salvation. O oh come, O oh come, Emmanuel. Please remain standing or open a hymn. You should all know it. O oh come, all ye faithful. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now, Mike's going to. Where is my date? Mike's going to bring us a song.
5, 16, verse 16 through 24. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit, do not treat prophecy with them, but test them all. Hold on to what is good, reject every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who calls you faithful, and he will do it. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I really want to sing in joy to the world this morning since we lit the joy candle this morning, but I'm uh, going to restrain from that. I was uh, playing in my mind, I have earworms that get to me a lot. The playing in was that, uh, you may remember it, but I was remembering singing it on the revival tours when my mother would play. And we would go down on country roads that John Denver had never been on. <laughs> We went to places like Deaton's Tabernacle. And I remember that place in Chocolate. I used to go swimming there when we'd be there in the, on the creek. But there was a wonderful song we sang called Joy Unspeakable. And then we don't sing it. It's not in our Methodist hymnal. It's not in our coke spirit. But it is in one that I have in my study called Heavenly Highways, or another one of his favorite songs and hymns. And it's written with shaped notes. I don't know if you music people understand shaped notes, but that's the way the Sims Baxter folks did it. But it's joy unspeakable. That's what we have today. But if we look at here and think about it, you know, some of us remember some time back, I don't know if you do or not, but there was an Academy Award going on, event going on, and this actor from Italy had won the Academy Award, and in an exuberance, he was climbing and jumping over the back of chairs to get up to the stage. And somebody asked him later, what brought you on like that? And his comment was this thing about you and I have. He says, the sign of mediocrity is when you demonstrate gratitude with moderation. He said, I couldn't be mo have any moderation. I wanted to be excited. I was joyful that day. And that's an interesting thing to think about it. The man, they think when we and I think of it, the sign of mediocrity all is when you and I demonstrate our gratitude with moderation. And it's sort of like uh, get excited and, 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 and stand up at times, but we don't. But this morning, we want to deal with both exuberant, joyful exuberance, as well as heart-filled gratitude we have in our life for what we're celebrating in Advent. We've gone through the candles of hope and peace and now joy. The next time it's love. And so we have to realize that. But think about it when we're here today. I want to take a little lighter touch today. I don't want to get too deep in theology. I want us to, get us, I want us to have a little bit of, of uplifting and joyful feelings about it this morning. So it's going to be a little different today. How many of you love cats? You got an Albert, right? I thought of you would, unless I see hands going up back there. Well, I mean, to be joyful, I want you to think of this. Now, here was an individual that owned a cat, all right? Or the cat owned him, not really sure. But anyway, he wrote this, his name is Michael Newham. He wrote this thing called Of Cats and People. All right? Listen to what he said. And he's praying to God. Lord, this cat you gave me, she just doesn't listen. I told her the rains were coming. She goes out anyway and comes back soaked. I told her not to lie in the weeds, and yet every day she comes in and expects me to pull out all the stickers from her fur from lying in the weeds. I told her that much as it is up to her to be at peace with all the cats, and yet she expects me to tend her wounds when she's been in fights and comes home and has to be patched up. She embarrasses me, he said, in front of the neighbors, 
by instigating disputes with her cat. <laughs> she thinks she owns the whole block. She is constantly doing what she ought not to do and suffering the consequences. Worse, she seems to blame all her misfortunes on me. At least she expects me to deal with all the results of her disobedience. Always do, but she never seems to learn. Furthermore, Lord, she has never missed a meal. But when she's hungry, she yowls as if she hasn't eaten a meal in weeks. She makes it sound as if I'm a negligent and cruel father. The truth is that I always feed her and give her treats. Just wanted you to know, Lord, to top it all off. She is often distant and ignores me until she wants attention or me to provide something. This cat makes me feel used. Sometimes I wonder if she loves me or just loves what I can give her. It's a pretty one-sided relationship. But despite all of this, I love the cat. I've chosen to keep her, Lord, and that makes no sense. But I know you'll understand. Then he ends it with this comment. He says this, make your own application about that. And I got to thinking about that. Could he be saying that cats and people are not all that different from one another, but still the father loves them all. Mm -hmm. It's of the world, right? And also, I, you know, we're fortunate people. We need no fear of anything. Why? Because we have a father that loves us, crazily loves us. Mm -hmm. And let me ask you a question today. Thinking about it today in your life, here we are on the third Sunday of Advent, the Joy Sunday. Do you think that you know what God's will is for you? Do you know? I hear people ask, is this God's will for me? Or is that God's will? Did such and such happen because of God's will? Would you like to know what God's will is for each of us? What God has in our life? And it's right there, you heard it read in 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter. And he says, as Paul was writing to that church in Thessalonica, he's writing to us today in this joyful Sunday. Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this, listen now, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. That's your will. That's what it's about. There it is. It's there. God's will for you and me is to be joyful, to pray without ceasing, and to give thanks in all situations in our lives. Now there's times I have trouble with those comments that Paul was writing to the church about. There's times I can't be joyful if it's to be with you. Now I imagine that you don't have any difficulties with praying without ceasing, particularly while you're in here this morning, right? You're praying that preacher will hurry up and get through and not get more eat. You may even find no difficulty with giving thanks in all circumstances in our lives, though that is a little more challenging. But this morning, I want us to think about one that's really challenging, and that's to devote our attention to the more neglected instruction that Paul was writing to us today about is the fact, be joyful always. I, that eats on me. I have problems at times with it. But I'm thinking about one of the great theologians was Pierre Tillhart de Charny. And he was one of these individuals that thought a lot deeper in his theology than I, than I enjoy reading. <laughs> But his comment was, joy is the most infallible sign of the presence of God. Now, think of that for a moment. Did you catch that? Joy is the most inf 
infallible sign of the presence of God. If you'd have been here yesterday, and you'd have seen children that were enthusiastically joyful in the midst of all that <coughs> blindfolded and trying to flip bows in, into, a, into, a, into a plate, they were amazed at how good some of them could do. They were, they were, there was joy in all their faces. But that's what we're for. You know, the, when we think about it, did you know that the Hebrew Bible, which most of us have not read because it is in the Hebrew, right? But the Hebrew Bible is, is the book of joy. When you read it in Hebrew, and it's sort of like what uh, Kaufman uh, Kohler said, and he stated the fact being that in the Hebrew Bible, that many words of joy and rejoicing as to the Hebrews. In other words, they use it constantly. Their religious which ritual demonstrates God's joy in our lives. He's the source of our joy. It's there. And if you think about it, you don't read that one, then pick up the New Testament and read it because it is loaded with joy. It's full of it. It's our book of joy as we think on it today. The will of God for you and me is be joyful always. To pray continuously and to give God thanks in every circumstance. That even in the bad circumstances you give thanks to God. And that's hard for us to grasp it, to wrap our minds around. One of the things many people have forgotten though, particularly in our Christian faith and the pilgrimage that we're going through, is the duty to be joyful. I don't know how you are, but a lot of times we've all thought of our Christianity as those that it being stern. Now, actually, one of the things that came about where there was a young man who literally gave his life to Christ, but he had trouble getting it, accepting it, if he was doing what he wanted. And he wrote to a leading father of the church, and he wrote these things. He says, Sir, I am earnest about forsaking the world and following Christ. But I'm puzzled, he said, about worldly things. What must I forsake? And the church father wrote him back. He was a celebrated Christian father of the church. He said, when he said, what are you going to forsake? He said, colored clothes, <laughs> for one thing. Get rid of everything in your wardrobe that's not white. Stop sleeping on soft pillows. Sell your musical instruments and don't eat any more white bread. You cannot, he said, if you are sincere about obeying Christ, take any more warm baths, listen to this, or shave your beard. To shave is to lie against him who created us to attempt to improve on his work. Think on that for a moment. Talk about kill joy. <laughs> Better advice is to be found in the plaque that you may find in a lot of pastor's studies. I don't know where mine has disappeared to, but I have plaques in this way come and go. It's like I have a book. I was looking for a book this morning from Barclay, and I realized I'd loaned it out. And in my age, I had forgotten to whom I loaned it to. So anyway, I can fall it. But if you think about it, we don't want to be killed, Joy. He says, if you have the joy of Jesus, please notify your face. <laughs> think about that. That's a marvelous plan. What is God's will for you and me in our lives? Be joyful. Be joyful in our lesson for today that you heard read. Be joyful in your life that you're here today. Be joyful as you sit over there and partake of the delicious meal that's going to follow this and the marvelous or regular thing. Set up for it. You're going to enjoy it. But when you realize that in our lives, you see, you and I need an abundance. Are you with me now? You and I need an abundance of joy in our lives. It's got to be joy unspeakable and full of glory, right? When we're there. I recently read another one, situation that occurred. Would you believe in the last 25 years, 
How many of you Google search? You search Google? I have a trouble every time I search for something on Google, it comes up on the right side of my screen <laughs> later that I have been looking for. But did you realize that in the last 25 years, or 20 or so years anyway, the search for how to be happy on Google has increased 180%. I didn't realize Google kept all of those kind of numbers, but they do, and I thought it was interesting. And I wanted to share it with you today. How to be happy. Somewhere I read about a Sunday school teacher that I listened to. <coughs> Sunday school teachers. Do you remember your Sunday school teachers and what all they taught you and how much they were important to you? And I was thinking of that, but I didn't, you know, think of that time. She had her Sunday school class, and now we're leaving Sunday school this morning, but next Sunday I want you to read Isaiah chapter 9 and come back next Sunday and we'll talk about it. And so they all got back in Sunday school the next Sunday, and they were all there, and she asked them, she says, okay, I want to know something. How many of you read Isaiah 9? And all the hands went up. She said, exciting, wonderful. I've got a piece of candy for anyone who can complete, complete the second half of the verse, the people who walk in darkness. And here she was. This, this, I love children. I, I, I think they, that's why I always like children's moments. Because you never know what they're going to say or what they're going to do. Can you imagine this teacher asking this question of her Sunday school, of her Sunday school class? The people who walk in darkness, and somebody said, use less electricity. <laughs> She said it again. The people who walk in darkness, another one says, stub their toes a lot. She said it again. The people who walk in darkness, the time kind of the class king, spend almost all their time sleeping. The people who walk in darkness were usually burglars. The people who walk in darkness could really use the flashlight. When you realize what we're about in this walking in darkness, we walk in, I'm, I'm standing in the light, but at times I'm in the darkness. And we are. I love the thing back. I don't know how many of you are, know much about the state of Texas. But if you've ever been to the state of Texas, the state capitol has a star on top of it. Do you realize they were sued by the ACLU because it was having trouble of separating church and state star? I love it. Ann Richards was governor of Texas when this was all going on. And they said to remove the star, and Governor Richards says, Oh, I hate to see that happen. This could be the only time we will ever get three wise men in that building. <laughs> you see, the joy and everything. What do you think of it? Or I'm going sure like the, the mother of Johann Guth. But she said about her life and what it was meant to her. Think about the joy in life. Now, Johann was a poet, but his mother was very wise. She had a meaningful lines that you and I say, oh, this day of joy. I rejoice in my life because the lamp still glows. How many of you give thanks when you flip on the light in the morning? I seek no thorny ways. I love the small pleasures of life. We don't stop to think about those at times, do we? If the doors are too low, I bend. I was watching a John Wayne movie, and he was a white man, and all the women, all the doors are too short for John Wayne. You remember he had to stoop to get in all of them over there. But anyway, she said, I bend. If I can remove a stone from the path, I do so. But I love what she says next. If it's too heavy, I go around it. <laughs> yeah. I find something in every day that pleases me. Do we? <clears throat> Joy, joyful always. And then she goes on and says, the cornerstone. My belief in God. And it makes my heart glad and my face shine. Are our faces shining this morning? 
I like to put an unauthorized, I mean, unauthorized, unknown author. I'm trying to put two things together and you have trouble when you have your arm seriously and they don't fit. <coughs> Who could put it any better than this, they said about Goethe's mother? Because joy comes from the very simple and beautiful pleasures in life. It comes from loving and being loved. That's what joy comes from, all right? It comes from walking daily with God. You want to have some time with God? Sneak out early in the morning before the sun is up and the stars are shining and the planets are out there and the moon last night as I left here was gorgeous. When you think of it, spend some time with God. It, it, comes, it comes from believing that God has a plan for our lives. You wouldn't be here if you didn't have that thought in your mind, but you didn't really bring it and make you conscious of it all the time. I don't. But the marvelous thing is, every time I think about it, he's there reminding me, hey, be joyful always. He leads us and leads to pleasures forevermore. William Barclay, one of my favorite writers, and you've probably seen his writings on the books of the New Testament, makes a wonderful analogy of Jesus. Here what he is. Dr. Barclay says, Jesus was perfectly at home at a wedding feast. He was no severe, authentic, or austere killjoy. He enjoyed in times of life. He went on to say he loved to share in the happy rejoicing of a wedding feast. And there were certain religious people who shed gloom wherever they go. And there are certain people who are superstitious of joy. Can you imagine that? Being superstitious of joy and of happiness. To them, religion, Dr. Barclay says, is the thing of black clothes, the lowered voice, the expulsion of social fellowship. They descend like a gloom wherever they go. But listen to what he said. Jesus never counted it a crime to be happy. Why should his followers not be joyful? Why indeed? What is God's will for your life? What is God's will for my life? To be joyful always? To pray without ceasing? And to give thanks in all circumstances? And that brings nothing to us but joy our world. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Please stand as we sing our hymn going forth, number 224, Good Christian Friends, friends Rejoice.
wish to shine upon you. Maybe will you would come and join the meal with us and enjoy the time together. And next Sunday is Christmas Eve. We will have services at 10, right here. But at 6 o'clock, there is a surprise visitor coming. So come and see who makes appearance that evening. Continue to be blessed by the Lord. May he be with you all this week. Bless you and walk with you and give you strength and give you joy this day. Amen. Turn to all those around you and say what? I love you and there's nothing you can do about it. Offer God's love to all men.